Rich, welcome to the Digital Scene Show here at uh, Production Summit, uh, produced by VES. Uh, tell us a little bit, you just made a great presentation, very inspiring. Can you tell us a little bit about you? Okay, about me? Or? About you and the presentation, the whole thing. Okay. I'm a scientist at JPL, and uh, my background is astronomy, uh, thinking about the universe, but lately I've been working on a field called evolutionary computation which takes supercomputers and tries to uh, create systems that, e that evolve, that uh, make mistakes, cull the mistakes, and, and capitalize on, on the very, very infrequent mistakes in your error. And, and we're finding that we can actually um, gain complexity. Uh, we can invent things and discover things using this kind of process. And what I'm very, very excited about is the, f the future really um, is moving in a direction where we're going to be able to use tremendous advances in computation to, to, to really change the way we do things. You brought up some really good points about uh, Moore's Law and how things change, and I think that's really important for people in any field, but specifically yeah. in digital filmmaking, because we spoke before we started, but I have a, a camera here that used to probably cost you know, thirty or $300,000, and now you can get it for $2,000 right. and get better quality than before, right? right. So it's, I think you brought up a lot. So how, you, know, you spoke about Moore's Law and things like that. Okay. Explain how that, uh, that applies to people in, in the film industry. One of the basic frameworks for where we are are things called Moore's Law. Moore's Law is not really a law, it's an observation. The observation is that currently uh, computational power increases by a factor of two every 13 months. And we live on this Moore's Law increase in power. And it's, a, it's an increase that is uh, very, very hard to understand. The past doesn't look anything like the future. And we are on the cusp of being able to have computational power absolutely unheard of. The fastest computers in the world today are computing about twice the computational speed of the human brain. It takes about a decade, about 12 or 13 years, for that supercomputer to be in the hands of our children. Playstations uh, and, and those right. kinds of toys are basically what supercomputers were 13 years ago. Right. So there, there's this incredible progression, and the progression we're going to see over the next decade is that we're going to have in our hands, at affordable prices, computational toys that can compute on the level of the human brain. Now, that doesn't mean they're smart. It doesn't mean they can, they're cognizant. It means that they have the potential to do that. And I think that the field of evolutionary computation, where instead of um, taking apart the human brain and understanding and then copying it, there's another way to, to, to solve that problem, and that problem is to try different things and to discover the solution. And I think computation and evolution together will get us there. Now let's add one more factor, which is cost. You, you know, you're getting all this power, but the cost is, is affordable pretty much to everybody. So how does that affect current digital filmmakers? That they, because you're pretty much putting this power and technology in the masses now. Before it was right. to a few now. now you, so how do they compete against basically the kid that has a PlayStation or the iPhone can, that can shoot a movie better than a movie was shot 20 years ago? Well, cost is one thing you have to model into, in, into what you do. Okay. Uh, costs also decrease by a factor of two every year. You get more computation, you get lower costs. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of infrastructure, and the infrastructure that we have in place is already incredibly capable of delivering you know, high-def signals. It's, incredible, it's, it's capable of delivering the kinds of, of computational throughputs right. that go through the eye. The eye throughput, if you had to you know, paint an entire screen so everybody can look at it with, with human binocular stereo resolution, it would be 20 million, uh, 200 million pixels. Hmm. But the eye really only sees 5 million pixels. That's what goes into the brain. And 5 million pixels is something that we can do readily right now in real time. Uh, it's what our computational engines can do, it's what our video games can do, it's, right. it's, it's, it's what HDTV does. And the question is getting that technology to be able to do that and throughput it and have an immersive experience. And the other message that I have is that what we have in our heads is that experience will take 20 years before it'll reach a paradigm for the masses. And the real message is that it's not taking 20 years for, for big paradigm shifts, it's taking a year or two. And since the infrastructure is already in place, things like that could happen very, very quickly. And businesses that aren't aware of, of these uh, very, very quick turnarounds in, in, in human societal uh, ideas and paradigms will get lost in the dust. So is 3D a stepping stone into that next paradigm shift? Because, I mean, it's, it's bringing you into that immersive experience, but you've got to wear glasses. So yeah, I, I use 3D because right? it, there, there's, another, there's another concept that I talked about, which is this hype curve. 
okay, where, where you start off with a technology and you're really, really excited about it and you have all this incredible expectation about it and then you crash into desperation when it doesn't right. work. <laughs> and then only slowly you kind of climb out of this valley of desperation and, and, and things get adopted. And we're seeing that same kind of you know, boom and bust cycle with 3D. Uh, and, and everybody has the expectation that, oh, well, 3D, the ultimate is going to be everybody's going to have a 60-inch, you know, uh, high-def screen at home that'll have the 3D experience. And maybe that's not the right paradigm, okay? Maybe the right paradigm is everybody's going to have uh, immersive glasses that will convey an image, and you don't need a 60-inch screen. And if we can get those costs down to a few hundred dollars and people working on that very well, and the video game industry is pushing toward that, and augmented reality is pushing toward that, and, and, and virtual reality is pushing toward that, and we're seeing the, the, the kinds of concepts. And remember, all you need to do is pump five million pixels through in a display like that. If you, if you, if you pump the right five million pixels, if you right. know where your, your pupil is tracking. And that experience, that can get into people's homes a lot quicker than a 60-inch you know, plasma uh, sure. binocular stereo uh, screen. Now, of course, part, part of that 60-inch thing is, is the experience of the socializing aspect where you have 20 people watching that game with you, right? Yeah. Versus that... But here's another paradigm for that. Okay, I put the glasses on. Now I can not only... Because I'm seeing a different thing than the person next to me who also has a pair of glasses on, I'm looking in different places, I can now put my avatar in that field. Sure. Constructed real-time with their avatar in that. So now I can now have a shared experience just like reality. Right. Okay, just like you and I talking, we're seeing different components of a room, sure. uh, we can have that same shared experience and be part of the entertainment. And, and that's really happening today. When you, you mentioned that during the presentation, immediately my first thought was seeing uh, so many people in dinner table, they're texting other people, so they're virtually communicating right. as if they were in the same place. They're not even communicating with the people in front of them, they're, that's right. right? So that's it's right. kind of like that, that experience where everything is, is blurring. You mentioned what is reality when you take glasses off? Are you in reality or right. are you still in that virtual? That's right. That's right. right. So, uh, when, when reality, when, when simulated reality becomes indistinguishable from real reality, then you cross a line. And the line gets blurred as to what is objective reality. Is objective reality really real? Uh, are we one subset of, a, of many, many simulations? And who's doing the simulation? Sure. Now, if people want to learn more about your field, do you have a website? Can they go to NASA? I think JPL, right? You, you work for? I work for JPL, but the, the, the stuff I talk about is uh, a lot of stuff I do in, in, in my consulting. Uh, okay. So do you want to give your URL, your email address? It's rich, R-I-C-H dot Terrell, T-E-R-R-I-L-E, like terrible without a B, at okay. dot com. Excellent. Well, great to meet you, Rich. Okay. Excellent. Thanks.